Holmes, do you know what all this implies? If the secret intelligence service is somehow involved, there's only one person I can trust for further answers. Elementary. One of the slogans on the street is, the world is not for sale. To 70% of the U.S. economy is devoted to consumer goods today of GNP. Is I consume, therefore I am, really enough to base life on? If advertising went around us, will we still want all this? If we can afford them, will we still want them? I feel played, manipulated, and enslaved. Maybe like those making my new Jordans. Tidewaters, powerful, relentless, seemingly unpredictable, but ever moving, ever changing as these swirling currents are, Daily they are being checked, charted, and forecast as to the time and size of their ebb and flow. Like the waters of a mighty ocean, people also represent a tremendous force, the understanding of which is of greatest importance to the American way of life. This force is known as consumer power. In response to the potential demands of consumer power, American initiative and industry have created in the United States the highest standard of living ever enjoyed by any people. Outdoor advertising is a powerful force to this end. Day after day, by keeping consumers informed concerning what products of industry are available and where they may be obtained, outdoor advertising is making its contribution to the development of American prosperity. In the morning, in any community, men, women, and children leave their homes. They are on the move. And as they move, they do numerous things. They work, they play, they study, and most important of all, they buy. Many insects and animals don't see things this way. For an ant, the survival of the species is the main objective, and they carry out that purpose with singular devotion. But I'm not an ant, I'm a human, and I can't change the way humans are. The only person who I'm gonna change is myself. I need to figure out how I'm going to spend my own life. The only problem is, there's a hell of a lot of people trying to tell me how I should live, what I should want, and what I should be doing. Companies often insinuate that their products can make me happy, that without them I'm worse off. They always make me feel like the whole point of life is simply to have things. When I do buy something that I've wanted, it generally doesn't make me feel happier for a very long time. The initial satisfaction is always dissipated by a whole host of new desires. What about the here and now? The present is so intangible that by the time it exists, it's already gone. If I spend those long but finite succession of presents always off in the future, it's debatable whether I've lived at all. People come before markets. So for centuries, merchandisers have instinctively attempted to follow the crowd. They understand that a retail outlet fails or prospers according to its relative accessibility to buyers. Originally, a market was the actual place where commodities were bought and sold. Since that time, a market in its broadest sense has come to mean primarily effective demand. Markets are people. The market of today is considered to be any area provided with means for the movement of persons and commodities. An area occupied by people who have common and daily economic interests. Without people having demands and the capacity to satisfy those demands, there could be no market, no trade activities. And now to make the jump, what happened sometime in the 1950s, 
that had been happening for a while, but what emerged then was increasingly a capitalist economy no longer able to de depend on manufacturing goods and services to meet real human needs and wants, many of which were largely satisfied, and in its place increasingly in a world of overproduction that Bill Greider writes about, I think tellingly in his works, in that world of overproduction, a capitalism that increasingly started to manufacture not goods to meet needs, but needs to sell all the goods that it had. And as the manufacture of needs and wants supplanted the manufacture of goods, marketing, advertising, the selling of brands increasingly became central to the capitalist enterprise. And that in turn has created the foundation and the need for a different and new ethos. Early capitalism, relying on the production of goods to meet real needs, focused on saving, on deferred gratification, and on hard work. But an economy in which consumerism is a necessity of the survival of capitalism, increasingly looks not at hard work but leisure, looks not at production but consumption, and looks not at the satisfaction of real needs but the manufacture of artificial needs and wants to stay in business. Potential consumers are also reached by this all-inclusive medium. As purchase influencers, Chicago's 750,000 school children represent an active group of great value. Though grown-ups represent the greater part of any community's purchasing power, children very definitely are an influence in the purchasing of everyday commodities. So the complete poster showing must take into consideration the location of public schools with their daily attendance, which mounts up into hundreds of thousands. Since public schools are laid out primarily in accordance with population densities, the pattern governing school locations is a thoroughly accurate pattern of actual population distribution. For this reason, it is significant that the pattern of poster showings coincides with school concentration in the same areas. And if you look at uh, the top grossing films for the last couple of years, Shrek, Spider-Man, Harry Potter, and The Incredibles, 19, that's 2003 and 2004. Every year, it's gangbuster-style comic book films made for 15-year-old boys or romances and fantasies made for 14-year-old girls that are the best-selling movies all over the world to every age demographic, thanks to the successful marketing campaigns, which, in effect, dumb down adults. When you dumb them down, you have another very powerful and necessary effect. You reduce their efficacy as gatekeepers. Adults, parents are understood by, and this is the term of the marketing industry, gatekeepers. They stand between those who have something to sell to children and the children. They watch the gates. You want to sell to the children, you've got to get around the gatekeepers. Now, in a world where you're trying to sell more and more to people who may need and want less and less, naturally you go after the kids. You go after the teens, because they have a lot of discretionary income. But then you go after the tweens, between 10 and 12, and then you go after the younger ones, and finally you go after the toddlers and the babies, because they are potential consumers. You can get them early and keep them their whole lives, but the problem is between you and them stand the gatekeepers, the parents, and the mantra of the marketers is remove the gatekeepers. Up until a few years ago, there was no way of scientifically obtaining this vital information. So in 1933, the Outdoor Advertising Association of America, working in conjunction with the Association of National Advertisers and the American Association of Advertising Agencies, combined to set up the Traffic Audit Bureau under the guidance of Dr. Miller McClintock. But scientifically planned showings must cover more than just the main thoroughfares of transportation. They must be arranged to reach consumers in every walk of life as they go about their daily tasks. Each day as thousands of persons visit the chain stores in their neighborhoods, their journey carries them past powerful messages advantageously placed on nearby poster panels. 
at night as they visit their favorite movie houses, or to work in any one of the busy industrial centers, these hundreds of thousands of buyers repeatedly receive up-to-the-minute information concerning products necessary to their daily living. People often say about advertising, well, why don't you just turn it off? But in many of these cases, the point is that you don't have the choice whether or not to turn it off. Where do these people come from? How far do they travel in going back and forth to work? Outdoor advertisers can check these facts for any poster panel location by jotting down the license numbers of passing automobiles and tracing their home addresses through the automobile registration records. Another method of showing that traffic circulates all over the city and not just in specific areas is to locate the home addresses of all the employees of any large industrial organization and make a pattern of the distances they travel through all parts of the city in going back and forth to their jobs. I feel like I'm getting played. Advertisement is the world. It's on TV, radio, internet, billboards, and even cell phones. We are bombarded by advertising images every minute of our life. You can't escape it. So, does it really make me jump higher and run faster? If you told enough times, you start believing it. I don't believe what they tell me, but I still want them because they're the thing for teens. It's a love and hate thing. I love them because they're cool, and I hate them because they're exploiting the people that make them and ranking in the huge profits for consumers that buy them. 20 million self-identified shopaholics, and I don't mean that allegorically or metaphorically. I mean people who see it as a serious addiction, who see it as a disease, who see themselves as, as compulsively going out to shop without a shopping list, without a need or a want in mind, simply because buying itself has become a compulsive activity for them. And the American Medical Association is currently considering listing shopaholism as a serious addiction. And there are at least a half dozen centers for substance abuse that are now also treating shopaholics. So this isn't just a metaphor and a kind of extravagant way of talking about people who shop a little too much. And so it is with every panel in every city and general outdoor advertising company's poster showing. Each location is selected on a basis of known rules of traffic. The number of persons who move past each panel over a given time is an accurate, scientifically established figure. So accurate is this figure, it forms an immutable law. Where you find the poster panel, there you'll find the traffic moving to market. Strategic locations ensure repetition, and repetition creates consumer remembrance, driving home a message, not once, not twice, but many times thus bridging the gap between the manufacturer and the consumer. By scientifically charting the ebb and flow of populations and traffic, by erecting strategic power plants designed to generate consumer acceptance for American industrial products, General Outdoor Advertising Company is making its contribution both to modern business and to the great American public. If you're sad, buy something. Engage in some retail therapy. Eat some chocolate, have some drinks, take some antidepressants. We see these messages everywhere we look because people need us to buy what they're selling just so that they can have all the things that they want. They're not really concerned with my happiness, they're concerned with their own. That doesn't mean that I shouldn't buy the things that I want. It just means that I should think hard about the difference between what really enables me and what I'm just being conned into. If I sometimes feel like the world is up shit creek without a paddle, the best thing I can do is to start thinking about where I can limit my own impact on the planet. Our problems might be an ocean, but it's still made up of individual drops. I need to remember that I can't be expected to change the world, but I'm still responsible for my own behaviour. So I'm standing on this planet, and I'm part of a complicated species that spans the entire world. I don't agree with a lot of what we do, but I love so much of it. It's a hard thing being human sometimes, but I'm just going to have to do the best that I can. <laughs>